Hi, welcome to the session. Thanks, audio is good. Um, here's a brief agenda of what we are going to be talking about today. Uh, we want to give you first a, a brief overview or, or introduction to ray tracing for games um, with RTX uh, and DirectX ray tracing and also GameWorks technology, uh, GameWorks ray tracing technology that we've been working on. We'll be going into some of the details of this technology and telling you more about how we combine ray tracing with uh, real-time denoising. Um, and we will also talk about other things you can do with ray tracing, uh, in, in, such as path tracing and live baking. And finally, to close, we will give you some tips on integrating ray tracing into your engine with, uh, with this technology. All right. so. The first thing uh, to get out of the way here, in case uh, not, you haven't for, uh, ever heard about ray tracing, is to very briefly explain what that is. Uh, most games today use uh, rendering techniques based on rasterization, and in some cases, some types of ray tracing. What we're talking about today as ray tracing, it's a primitive that you can use to query the intersection of rays against some geometry. Uh, this is a very um, simple depiction of that process where a ray is defined by a ray origin and a ray direction. And, uh, as, and, and the basic primitive it's, can be implemented in many different ways, but it basically has to provide to you back the intersection of that ray or set of rays with uh, the primitives in the scene. And you may be able to find uh, there are different types of queries that can be implemented to, to return the first hit or the closest hit or many hits along the ray. Um, with this primitive, there are many applications uh, in games, and we've been working on, on some of these other media. Uh, some of them are useful to increase the quality uh, of in-game rendering in real time, such as uh, for effects like reflections, ambient mean, occlusion, or, or shadows. Other applications are more well-suited for or to improve content creation workflows, like light baking, or rendering full quality cinematics with film quality or generating uh, uh, reference quality patriots images that you can use as a guideline uh, for other techniques. There are also other non-rendering applications for retracing in games, which we believe this technology can be used for too. Uh, one of them, for example, is audio simulation in VR, and we, we have an API called VRWorks Audio for that, which is built on top of our optics API. Other application uh, is physics and collision detection and AI, uh, for example, to implement visibility queries for agents in the world. We're going to focus in this talk on the top half of this slide, which are rendering-related applications. In rendering, ray tracing is commonly used to solve, uh, or approximately solve, the rendering equation with Monte Carlo sampling. The rendering equation, uh, briefly summarized in this uh, slide, um, is, it states that the light uh, outgoing at a given point in space in a given direction is the result of adding up the, sum, uh, 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 the emitted light in that direction by that object at that point in space uh, and the integral of the reflected uh, incoming light at that point uh, from all directions into the outgoing direction. It's very high level. With that, uh, Given that uh, ray tracing can be used to solve this equation and generate photorealistic images, uh, it is also a natural solution to solve parts of this equation, which games tend to do in various ways. So shadows, ambient occlusion, reflections, and light making tend, tend to solve a subset of the, the equation. And film rendering tries to usually solve the whole equation. So all of these are applications uh, of ray tracing and rendering. Um, Similar primitives, as I mentioned before, are also used today in games in real time already. So ray tracing is not really, should be not really that new for you, for many of you, if you're familiar with the techniques like a screen space ray trace, ray trace reflections or shadows, distance field ray tracing or voxel count tracing. All of those are already in use today and, and they are trying to uh, approximately find uh, what is intersecting in the given direction in the scene. Uh, but usually with uh, coarser representations that, that have some limitations. In this talk, we talk about ray tracing against the full geometric representation of a scene, uh, commonly in most cases made out of triangles, but not always. And um, 
We and usually rendering with ray tracing uh, requires many samples to achieve really high quality results. Um, film rendering will typically use from a few hundred to a few thousand samples uh, to achieve really high quality images. Depending on the complexity of the intergram or the scene, uh, its materials, its geometry, uh, etc., it will require more or less samples. Here are some example images generated with some number of samples, in this case, ray shadows from a spherical area light. And here's another one uh, generated uh, also with some number of samples for ambient occlusion, and finally for uh, glossy reflections. Well, uh, that's great, but uh, hundreds of samples are not really possible per pixel today uh, on current hardware in real time. So, um, a small number of rays instead is what we have available at our disposal. Is that useful enough? We believe that the answer is yes. The previous images were actually generated with one or two samples per pixel and real-time denoising. So we believe that this combination is actually key to enable real-time ray tracing today. I would like to tell you a bit more about the technologies that we've been announcing this week. RTX, Zurich X-ray tracing, and, and GameWorks ray tracing. And, and then I will hand over the, the mic to Edward, so, to, who will go into all the details of how we do ray tracing with denoising in real time. NVIDIA RTX is our ray tracing technology for Volta GPUs. It is the result of a decade of GPU ray tracing R&D at NVIDIA, with products like the Optics Ray Tracing API and the iRay photorealistic renderer. It is exposed via Microsoft's new DirectX ray tracing API for DirectX 12. And combined, they provide to you, the developers, a new pipeline that goes along the compute and, and, and graphics raster pipeline that, that you should be used to. We call this a ray tracing pipeline. The benefits of RTX and DirectX ray tracing uh, are that they provide a really powerful and flexible programming model similar to that in NVIDIA's Optics API. It is easy to write efficient ray tracing algorithms with this API. DXR, furthermore, makes it really easy to integrate into engines that already use DirectX 12. It also provides an IHV agnostic abstraction layer that allows uh, developers to leverage that technology in any platform that runs DirectX 12. RTX our technology provides an efficient implementation on NVIDIA Volta GPUs. RTX on Volta delivers performance that we believe is needed to enable real-time ray tracing. For more details on DXR, I encourage you to attend Matt Sandy's talk at 3.30 p.m. today and visit their blog and our blog for more details. GameWorks Ray Tracing is another uh, technology that we've announced this week, GameWorks, as you may know, is our vehicle to deliver tools, simulation, rendering technology to developers. We announced this week GameWorks ray tracing denoising modules, which we will be making available soon for ray trace shadows, ambient occlusion, and reflection denoising. There is also a lot of work related to DirectX ray tracing and RTX at GDC this year. And uh, if you have missed the talks on Monday, I encourage you to to look out, look out that content. Uh, Microsoft announced on Monday the API, DirectX, uh, DirectX Ray Tracing, Future Market Remedy uh, presented really exciting talks on what uh, their experiments with this API. Um, also, just uh, over an hour, two hours ago, um, Epic Games showed for uh, the Reflections demo, uh, which is based on a lot of the same technology we'll, we'll be presenting right here, right now. And this is a collaboration of Epic Games, NVIDIA, and ILMX Lab. And there are more talks in this session, uh, uh, in this room later today, which uh, will be presented by NVIDIA Research, Electronic RC, and Frostbite teams. And I encourage you to stay for those as well. They, they will be very exciting. And um, finally, there is again that talk by Microsoft, uh, in combination with Electronic Arts, about the future of DirectX, which will definitely cover DirectX ray tracing. So what to expect in this talk? We're going to showcase what the possibilities are for real-time ray tracing with RTX. We're going to give you some details on that uh, NVIDIA GameWorks ray tracing denoising technology that we are going to make available to you soon. And uh, overall, our goal is to inspire you uh, to start experimenting with real-time ray tracing and hope that that's what you will find out of this talk. So 
With that, I will hand over to Edward. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. So I am Edward Liu, and I believe that ray tracing, real-time ray tracing is the next step forward for real-time rendering. However, just doing ray tracing naively all, often produce a lot of noise in the result image. So that's why today in my part of the talk, I'll first do a bit of a general discussion on the challenges that we have been facing uh, trying to solve this real-time denoising problem. And then I'll provide an overview of some of the really exciting results that we have achieved in terms of real-time ray tracing denoising. And finally, I'll also show the possibilities of implementing offline light transport algorithms such as pass tracing in your game engine with DXR and show the benefit of that uh, to the content creation process. All right, let's get started. So let's begin by briefly looking at why there's noise in ray tracing based rendering. So, so like Nacho mentioned, uh, rendering creation is basically an integral of several product uh, of uh, several uh, complicated equations de defined over the hemispherical domain over some certain shading points. There's this incoming radiance, which might have a really complicated visibility term. There's also BRDF, which is you know tricky to sample and cause you uh, cause you noise from sampling too. So that is typically why, and also uh, uh, in terms of global illumination, the incoming radiance itself is also recursively defined as the outgoing radiance as some other surface point in the scene. So that's why typically uh, you, you would expect to need to have at least hundreds, if not thousands of samples to get you some uh, clean image rendered with ray tracing. And, uh, but in the case of real-time rendering, uh, the realistic budget for us is probably only one to two samples per pixel which is extremely insufficient for you to get anything reliable. So uh, to fight those noise over the recent years, people actually come up with a lot of different approaches. And many of these offline renders these days are actually pairing up with a denoiser to clean up, clean up the image after the rendering. And in fact, this is a really, really active area of research. For example, listed here are only a selective set of publications from last year. And the first two are actually from NVIDIA. And uh, the SVGX work basically use tempor temp the spatial information from the current frame combined with temporal information from history frame to, uh, to denoise one sample per pixel pass tracing and achieve really good results. And next, the recurrent autoencoder uh, work, we basically try to achieve the same thing, but by just feeding everything to a neural network and let it figure out the sequ sequential relationship between the history frame and the current frame. So it's quite, quite amazing that the neural network can also do this, this type of thing quite well. And apart from these, researchers from UC Berkeley actually had a serious series of effect-specific denoisers that's all using uh, Fourier spa space light transport simulation analysis. And uh, for example, there is this work called access aligned filter for soft shadow denoising, and there's also this shear filter for AO and shadow denoising. And, uh, and finally, uh, film studios like Disney also been using deep learning neural networks to uh, to do denoising. And in the, the work listed there, instead of, instead of using the neural network to directly filter the image, they actually use the neural network to predict the spatial filter kernel for each pixel and then apply the, the filter, spatial filter over the image. And of course, there's also a large body of work that has not been mentioned on that. And, uh, and on the production side, we also have, we also have really awesome product like, uh, like the AI-based denoiser that we're currently shipping in Optics 5. So uh, all, of, all of those approaches that I mentioned earlier, they have different uh, performance versus quality trade-off. But I think it's, it, it is generally safe to assume that the typical expected input is at least tens, if not hundreds, of samples per pixel, which is still too much for real-time budget. And other work like SVGF, they only use one sample per pixel. However, they depend heavily on reprojecting the history information back to the current frame. So that works okay when you have the correct information, correct motion vectors in your scene. But for a lot of the circumstances, you just don't have all the correct uh, motion vectors. And for example, uh, we don't yet know, know how to efficiently compute the motion vector for soft shadows casted by an area light source on some moving geometry. So when you don't have the motion vectors, your filtered result would just end up with a lot of ghosting. And it, that's not acceptable to us. Um, and the cost of those denoisers mentioned earlier are maybe from hundreds of milliseconds to minutes, which is very fast compared, compared to waiting for the pass tracer to converge, of course, but it's also a totally sto different story in real time. Like our frame time budget is only 16 milliseconds. Uh, 
So the other thing that is worth mentioning here that is that most of the previous denoisers assumed the primary visibility, visibility buffer is also very noisy because they simulate depth of field and motion blur via stochastically sampling the visibility buffer. And, and, uh, and that's also different in games. Uh, for real-time rendering in games, we just have a totally different set of budget and requirement. First, it is just simply not realistic for us to be able to afford more than a very few number of rays per pixel. Therefore, we wish to work with extremely little sample count input, and we actually target one sample per pixel for all the effects that we're interested in denoising. And second, we want to support dynamic scenes, in including uh, dynamic camera, moving light sources, and moving objects. So using temporal information without the correct motion vector is also not an option. And, and, and also, we like our result to be temporally stable and flickering free across frames. And thirdly, the budget for the denoising itself cannot be too high either, since it is, it's going to be a newly added pass to your frame. So we target one millisecond for 1080p images on gaming class GPUs. So for the quality of the denoiser, I would say it's just not realistic for us to be able to achieve the same level of qualities to those offline ones, given the number of, uh, number of samples in our input and then the denoising budget. So, but however, we still like to get the result to be as perceptually as close to the ground truth as possible, especially when we want to preserve all the expected shading features for the stuff that you're denoising. For example, for soft shadows, you want to have contact hardening. For glossy reflections, you want to have uh, the uh, elongation when you're looking at the, from the grazing angle. Uh, so, uh, so lastly, and thankfully, we don't really have to deal with the noise that's in the G-buffer since uh, depth of field and motion blur, they're always done in post-processing in games. So after looking at all those requirements, we can also think about what our, our, our options are when des designing a denoiser. So first, we can choose between applying the filter in different space, and the, the simplest one is just to do filtering in screen space. And people also did it in light map space, path space, and actually in light view space as well. And, and then you can also choose to uh, only rely on data that's in the current frame, or you can somehow borrow data from history frame to either try to increase your effective number of sample count, or you can, uh, with that, to uh, improve tempor temporal stability and reduce flickering. Then we can decide what are the information that's available to, uh, to us aside from the one sample per pixel signal in the input. We can always collect some mean and some statistic, like a mean and variance from the input buffer. But apart from those, uh, the, the information in the G buffer, like normals and depth, they're also really useful to us. However, the other thing that is also useful is that uh, depending on the scene context, there's a lot of things in the rendering scene that can guide the filter. For example, for soft shadows, the size of the light source should definitely apply, apply, uh, uh, affect the, your, how you do the filter. Imagine you, if you just have a point light source, then your filter footprint should be zero, since there won't be any noise in your, in your filter. And also for ref reflections, obviously the roughness of the surface matter as well. And another really important design choice is that we can design effect specific filter, or you can, we can design filters that work on all the lighting component altogether. The, the former is probably more expensive since that might, we might need to do multiple filtering passes for each of those effects. But the latter is actually more trickier since we might, you might have different effects overlapping on the same pixels and they may require very different filter radius across them. So, so yeah, these are just the, the, the choice. And I'm really glad to say that we found some really exciting solutions among all the choices mentioned earlier, especially for denoising gloss reflections, area light shadows, and AO. So the denoisers that we came up with are all effect specific. So we have three different kind of denoisers that works completely differently for those uh, mentioned effects. And they all try to use other information in the scene context, like uh, the surface roughness or ray hit distance or light source size to guide the filter. And they're able to preserve all the shading features reasonably well, and they work pretty well at one to two samples per pixel compared with all the previous approaches. And it's also worth mentioning here that all the denoises that we're talking about here, they are really using one to two sample per pixel without temporal reprojection. So that means we don't really have to suffer from the, uh, the ghosting problem. All right, with that aside, let's look at some images. So Ignacio showed this image. So this is ray trace soft shadow with applied our denoiser with only one ray per pixel. And this is ray trace AO with two samples per pixel. And this is ray trace glossy reflection with one sample per pixel. All right, let's now take a, a bit closer look at 
at denoising ray trace shadow and, and also ray trace shadow in general. First, why do we even bother about using ray tracing to render shadows? And the biggest uh, reason is definitely that ray tracing can give you better visual quality for a large area like soft shadows. You can just produce physically correct, accurate um, penumbras even for really large area light source, which is not possible with shadow map based techniques. And the reason is that shadow map always use uh, you know, projection and non-stochastic rasterization. So the resulted shadows in the shadow map will be always a hard shadow, assuming that you only use one shadow map. And so blurring a hard shadow into a soft shadow won't get you very far because when your light source is large enough, they're actually quite different. And the other really common solution is, is capsule shadows. That's pretty common for character shadows. And since, since comparing with that, we're actually tracing rays against the actual geometry. So we should have much finer geometry details in, than capsule shadows. And also we support much more geom geometrically complicated occluder as well. And unlike distant field shadows, we support occluders with skin rigid body motion. And finally, with analytical area light shading being so popular nowadays, ray traced area light shadows can definitely be combined with those techniques to achieve really high quality area light shading in games. And in the content creation productivity side, I think nobody likes shadow map. Tuning it to work with, to robustly is always a, is always time consuming task. And you have to constantly fight the fact that they have different, the shadow map sampling rate is mismatching from the raster sampling rate. So maybe soon we can get rid of it. All right. More images. So this is the input to our denoiser, and then this is the filter filter result, and then that's that's the ground truth rendered with a lot of rays per pixel. I don't know. I don't have the exact number, but they're pretty converged. So if I if I flip back and forth, you can see that the ground truth still pre preserve higher frequency details better. So that's why I said we we only want to get perceptually close to the ground truth, but to re to get really close to ground truth at one sample per pixel is really challenging. And finally, we have the comparison with shadow mapping. All right, so with that aside, let's run the shadow stage demo that we, ha we have prepared. All shadow rays are using one ray per pixel. I hope that you like the demo and the music. And uh, now that you've seen this denoise in action, here is a brief overview of how it works. So first of all, the, the equation for rendering direct lighting can be written as a product between the cosine term, the, the BRDF, and then the direct radiance 
LD by sampling the area light source. So directly reconstructing this integrand can be quite tricky since uh, a really bright sample caused by a really strong, uh, strong direct lighting sample can be easily filtered into a really bright blob uh, if you're not careful. And thankfully, thankfully, there are just many existing algorithms out there which compute the direct lighting shading without the visibility term analytically. And most engine actually has built-in solution for analyt analytical shading of light sources with finite area. So, so here we can simply separate the whole integrand into the product of two, uh, two integrals and compute the shading integral uh, with analytical shading, which won't have any noise, and only denoise the visibility part, which is conveniently in the range of zero and one. So that uh, it's really friendlier to the denoiser. So for the actual denoising, we use a lot of the auxiliary, auxiliary information from the G-buffer as well as from the scene context to derive an optimal filter footprint for each pixel. The needed information including, including the ray hit distance, the scene depth, the world normal, the light source sizes and directions. Uh, and, the rec uh, and actually we have three different denoisers for the three type of light source that you saw earlier, which are directional light, spherical lights, and rectangular light source, each with different ways to estimate the filter footprint just so that we can get to optimal filter uh, result to, to very close to ground truth. And because the fact that the, the denoiser actually need input from the light source, so we, have, we actually need, we have to apply the denoising for each light source separately, which is uh, you know, suboptimal for performance since uh, that your performance is going to scale linearly with the number of light source that you have. But we just we achieved much better result by doing denoising this way, comparing with denoising all the light source together. But that's maybe there's some filter work. All right. With that aside, uh, let's look at uh, ray traced ambient occlusion and its denoising. So usually, for for AO, there's people use screen space techniques. And screen space techniques like SSAO, they just darkens the corner and edges, and they also, also tend to leave a dark halo around object borders. So it, fail, it also fills the viewport boundaries and cannot handle occlusion from off-screen geometry or in-screen geometry, but occluded. So, so there's some artifact there. But the most important reason I think ray trace ambient occlusion is going to be preferable is that ray tracing is actually curing the visibility around the scene surface point by actually tracing rays against the geometries in the scenes instead of just sampling the, across the depth buffer. So the results is just going to be more physically correct and gives you higher visual quality. So here is some comparison. So this is screen space AO. You can see it does give, provide a, a sense of occlusion, but if you look closer, it's also like an edge detection. It darkens everything at the edges, and there's a halo around that plant there. And this is our ray tracing based solution with two sample per pixel plus denoising. So you see it's, it's very different. And so it's an easy cell. And this is the ground truth, again, rendered with a lot of sample per pixel converged. And if, if we com uh, compare w with our denoise result, you can see that, again, the, ca the ground truth captures the, the fine details, high frequency detail in contact region better. But in general, I'm pretty impressed that we can get this close with only two samples per pixel. And then this is the input to our denoiser, which mm, makes you dizzy. And with that aside, let's run the AO demo. Here is a high-level overview of how the filter works. Uh, 
Our, our denoiser is, again, a cross bilateral filter with adaptive filter footprint per pixel. And the general idea is it's actually based on the existing publication called Access Client Filter for Indirect Diffuse from Meta et al. from 2013. So it's one of those four-year space analysis paper from UC Berkeley, which basically vary the filter size based on the ray hit distance. So intuitively, the visibility should change slower in open region than in contact region. So we can basically just apply the fil larger filter in open region, apply a smaller filter in, in the contact region. And that is really actually quite effective at preserving all the uh, the fine contact hardening details, high frequency contact details in the, in the contact region, which is something that we do want to preserve uh, in our denoiser. And the results that we are showing is with two samples per pixel. At one sample per pixel, it also worked pretty well, especially for you know, far field occlusion stuff. But for the near, near field contact, we, we, we need to get to, to at least two sample per pixel to reconstruct that well. So there's still some filter work. And with that aside, let's finally look at ray trace reflections and denoising. So as usual, let's compare ray trace reflection to some of the common techniques that are highly popular in games nowadays. The typical packages for reflection in games are, are the combination of screen space reflections or SSR or the pre-integrated environmental mental captures or light probes. On the SSR side, the biggest problem is, of course, the missing geometry, missing data problem. So it's, it's, it's really a jarring artifact that that I'm just pretty surprised at how tolerant gamers and developers has grown to be the artifact. You know, when you when you move your camera down, things just disappear in your reflections, and uh, so that's the biggest problem. And the minor, the other minor issue is that since we're actually reuse, reusing the shading in the primary color buffer, the shading is actually slightly wrong because in the reflection, the, all the shading should the view dependent shading should have a different view vector since you're not really looking at the shading from the camera anymore. So here is a screenshot of, of uh, screen space reflection. And uh, you can see that it, although the, because the reflected facet, the surface are, I guess they're hidden uh, behind, they're occluded by themselves. So the, the SSR just totally fails to capture their correct reflections. And those poor guys just turn into those things there. And uh, here's the screenshot of ray trace reflection instead. And you can see that everything is just normal here. And notice how the tape of the table and the shader ball actually have some reflection of the window that's totally outside of the viewport. And by the way, this is also denoised. Uh, so another, uh, the, another part of the equation, the package, is pre-integrated light probes. And the problem of that is that it's really static, and there's no scalable solutions for dynamic scenes. And second, the pre-integration or convolutions always assumes that your view vector is perpendicular to the scene, to the surface that's being shaded. So which means it loses all the interesting uh, anisotropic uh, elongations when, looking, when you look at the glossy reflection from the uh, grazing angles. And lastly, uh, the, the, su the surface roughness, should, it's continuous. But because we're doing this pre-integration, we have to discretize the roughness into different levels of textures. And then during rendering, we actually interpolate the roughness. So this can also lead to you know, uh, incorrect perceived roughness in the shading results. And light probes are really combined with SSR. And it works as a whole package when, you know, when SSR fail, light, light, light probe up. But the typical, the typical light probe shading is really quite different from SSR. So, so that's why you will have a weird transition region that's quite jarring. And finally, uh, there is also planar reflection, which does not have those jarring artifacts. But it only works for planar surface, so that's one limitation. And, and it only, it can, it only it, because it used rasterization, so it cannot do interesting stochastic effect like glossy reflections. All right, let's look at our denoisers. So this is the input, and for the surface, plane surface here, we use the GGX squared roughness of 0.18, and this is the denoise result. It's similar to the one that Nacho showed earlier. And this is the ground truth image. So they're a bit different here in terms of brightness, there, and there are a couple of reasons. So, so there are, first, we, we do have something to clamp away the really uh, high, really bright energy. And second, I think uh, in some way the denoise version is actually better because in the, in the contact region, I think there is some leaking happening there, and I do apologize for that. And, and lastly, let's compare to the SSR plus probe solution. And you can see that the highlight in the shaded by the probe, they loses the interesting anisotropic shape. And yeah, just not as good. All right, let's run the reflection demo. <laughs> 
So yeah, another high-level high overview of how the denoiser worked. And similar to the shadow denoiser, the reflections were also separating the integrand into two separate integrand and then integrating them uh, separately. In fact, for reflections, this is already pretty common in game, and I guess people call it split sum approximation. Like the BR, BRDF integral is often pre-integrated and then packed into a lookup table texture. In some sense, also here, applying denoising to the incoming radiance term is similar to doing the integral. And, and since here we're, we're not, uh, deno we're only denoising the incoming radiance term, it gives us uh, several advantages. First, we don't need to worry about overblowing the specular albedo since that's just not a part of the information that we're filtering. And, and second, the radiance term alone has just much less variance compared to a full Monte Carlo sample of this equation, which has a lot, lot of noise introduced by just sampling the BRDF. Imagine you have to have sample the tail of some GGX, and then you have to divide by a really small PDF, and then your sample just skyrockets. So as the actual filtering, our denoiser filter is also a cross bilateral filter uh, with adaptive and isotropic filter footprint. And the footprint is estimated based on projecting the shape of the BRDF load back to screen, screen space. And that's how we're able to preserve all the expected shading features like elongations and contact hardenings of the glossy reflections. All right, so we've shown all the denoisers and they look pretty good. But of course, we're not claiming that all of our solutions are perfect. For shadows, for example, it, the quality of the denoise results might be lower when you have uh, overly, overlapping penumbra from two occluders that's, that has a very drastically diff, different distance from the receiver. And for reflections, uh, the denoiser is really designed to work with moderate roughness. Like it's, it produces lower quality when your roughness goes above 0.4. But thankfully, we think it's below 0.4, that range. Uh, that's where the, all, the, all of those interesting shading features like elongation and content hardening, that's where uh, it's, it's mo most, most interesting. And for AO, we still need at least two rays to cover all the high frequency details that we'd like to cover in contact region. But we do have some more ideas to how to, on how to address those. And in fact, we're going to keep improving this over time to keep, you know, just keep improving the, uh, the, the balance on quality versus performance. In the future, we're also going to explore deep learning based solutions for these effects. And there are many existing works or that already, already leverage deep neural network to, to denoise fully past trace images. And given the same amount of input, the neural net should at least be able to figure out the same kernels that we're using by the handcrafted ones. And by, com by combining multiple convolutional layer together, it should only be figured out how to use more type of kernels. So eventually, maybe that's better. And other than that, we're also actively looking at combining some of the, these passes into multiple passes into a single pass so that we can ha save some time and memory. Uh, and finally, we're also looking into combining some uh, screen space ray tracing uh, with real ray tracing so that for data that's actually on screen, we can increase our effective sample count. All right. Uh, um, I just want to mention very briefly, the demos that we just shown were running in real time on the system right here. It, it's not a video. It's all uh, done with UE4 and sequencer, and, and that's why it looks like a video. But it's running in real time, which is why it was not 100% perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. All right, so I hope that you're excited as I am for the, all those cool real-time usage of ray tracing in games. Now let's look at uh, the possibility of in implementing light transport simulation algorithm like pass tracing in your game engine, and what, what is the benefit of that? So we all know that pass, trace, uh, pass tracing gets you the unbiased results, the solution for the rendering equation but they use hundreds to thousands of sample per pixel. And reuse the, uh, <clears throat> so although this is still too slow for real-time usage, but having a pass tracer in your rendering engine is actually extreme, ex extremely powerful since you will have the ability to quickly generate reference screenshots and then you can compare your existing renderers to the reference screenshots and, uh, and, and adjust your rendering accordingly. And this is really useful and, and powerful, especially when your engine already uses physically based shading and lighting, since given the same amount of input, the scene definition, they, they use the same unit. So th in theory, they should output a similar look. Uh, so it is, it is also pretty useful for tuning and validating rendering algorithms. For example, it tells you your whether your fast stochastic SSR is giving you the correct look in terms of you know, contact hardening when comparing to a pass tracer. It also tells you whether your image-based lighting solution is giving you the correct look in terms of perceived roughness or brightness. Uh, 
or whether your analytical light sh area light shading solution is getting you, getting you the correct results. And in fact, we have actually prototyped uh, pass tracing in RU4 integration, and it served as well when, de when developing those denoising algorithms that you saw earlier. So building a pass tracer in a game engine today is easier than ever before. Because you know, writing a pass tracer that is fast on modern GPU has not always been a challenging task. But now with the powerful programming model provide by, provided by DXR, and the optimized implementation of acceleration structure build, ray traversal, and scheduling by RTX, they handles a lot of these challenging things for you. And hopefully developers can now just focus in on the uh, light transport and algorithm side of things. And we don't have to reuse, uh, we, we don't even have to reuse separate code paths for them anymore. In fact, we can, all the HLSL shading code and the resource bindings can be reused. And finally, again, with physically based shading that's already commonly used in game engines, definitely make building a pass tracer on top of game engine easy because all the important sampling of the light source and of the, all, all the BRDF are already known. They're pretty standard, so we just, and they're not that hard to implement either, so. Uh, so we have, again, we have a prototype reference pass tracer in RU4 integration as a proof of concept, so it's not really at production quality yet. And how we did that, the process is pretty simple. Basically, we, we just added a new ray generation shader that runs the pass tracing loop logic. And then we simplify the base pass material shader in UE4 to not do any lighting, but, but just output all the material information that's needed for the pass tracer to do additional pass scattering. And this material information are passed back to the pass tracing ray generation shader via payloads. And this way, actually, all the material graph that's in UE4, we can just directly reuse them. So it's pretty, really convenient. And finally, we also added the important sampling on UE4's shading model, which is quite similar to Disney's principal BRDF, so it's also pretty standard. We also added important sampling of existing UE4 light pipes, which is just spherical light source, directional lights, and rectangular lights. And uh, for the purpose of doing direct lighting multiple important sampling, we actually have to add analytical ray light intersection so that our rays can intersect with spherical lights analytically and then you know, c calculate MIS accordingly. And finally, we also added the light calling to make sampling from multiple light source more efficient. And we all know that pass tracing converges very slowly, and even for non-real-time uses, we still like to wait less. So that's why we also hooked up our UE4 pass tracer with, our, with the deep learning-based denoiser that we're currently shipping in Optics 5 to accelerate the convergence. The denoiser used deep learning neural network to, to process the image, and unlike our real-time ones, it takes input with more, more than one sample per pixel, but it can produce results that is really close to ground truth. And just to quantify a bit, it improves the image with 0.8 SSIM to 0.99 SSIM compared to the reference ground truth image. It, it, leverages the, the, it leverages the tensor core that we have in Volta GPUs. So in our U4 integration, we can actually preview the results in real time really fast. Uh, so in the demo that we showed earlier, we're gonna blend smoothly between the noisy image to the denoise image. So you just feel like the convergence is really fast. All right, let's show the pass tracing one then. Yeah, we're, we're, we're running live. Lastly, I'll just briefly cover light baking with, with the XR, of course. Uh, 
you know, there are many types of light baking in games. There's a most common one that's the 2D light map that stores the, stores the lighting in the surface point in scene. There's also the volumetric one that stores this, uh, store the lighting in space, but that's used for dynamic geometries. And there's also light probes. That's also a type of light baking. And the focus today is the common 2D light maps for static geometries. So every engine uses light map and rely on some kind of light map baker. And most of these bakes are, are probably still running on CPUs with, with totally different code path uh, compared with your real-time renderer. So uh, developers nowadays, they will have to maybe export the scene to some kind of format that can be consumed by the baker. And then it's just not convenient. And with DXR and RTX, building an in-engine interactive light map baker that share the same rendering resources and code with the real-time renderer is also much easier. In fact, in our prototype implementation, we have reused a lot of the code for the that we have written for the reference pass tracer in our line map baker. And, and the, the pass tracer itself also reused all the shading and resource bindings in your, in your real-time render. So it's really, really easy than before, both, you know, both in terms of uh, make, writing the light baker and also you know, matching the result between different renders. So we have implemented two baking modes, one for preview and the other for batch baking. With the preview mode, we can basically just bake the line map while moving around interactively in the editor. For each frame, we just progressively update light map pixels that are in the current view. That's in, that in, that this enabled artists to iterate very quickly and the results of any adjustment to any objects or light source can be viewed instantly. And we have actually tried different ways of launching pass tracing work only in light map space that are texel, uh, in pixel that are current, currently visible. We started with launching works directly in the light map space, but in the end we found that it's just easier to just launch pass tracing work in screen space, but instead of storing the results in screen space, we store them in the, we project them to the pixel with uh, in the interlock at FP32. And we also implemented a simple denoise, uh, light map space denoiser uh, and combined with some smart temporal reuse, we're able to achieve near instant light map updates. And as in for the in editor preview mode, we can also do batch baking modes um, to basically bake all the light maps in a given level or uh, with, with one or multi GPU until they're converged. And here we'll need to dispatch ray generation shader with a 2D grid per line map texture or per line map atlas. For shooting rays for pass tracing, we'll need to get the per texel uh, shading attributes like precisions and normal so we can start rays from some space in the world. The traditional ways to do that is to use conservative rasterization and compute the interpolated vertex attributes uh, in line map space. But since we're going to trace rays anyway, we actually just build an acceleration structure uh, with the light map UVs. And then we launch a 2D grid and trace rays to the UVs. And upon intersection, we can directly uh, you know, use, the, uh, use the hit data there to <coughs> scatter additional rays to do pass tracing. Each approach has its own pros and cons. The new approach is probably more convenient since we can directly trace rays in the same shader. Uh, after getting the attributes, but it loses the benefit of conservative rasterization. All right, we will play the demo that we prepared for light map baking, and then I will hand the stage back to Ignacio. I hope that was exciting. At least it didn't crash. <laughs> so um, I would like to tell you a little bit about how we integrate ray tracing 
and, and basically give you a high level five minute overview of, of the usual process. You will probably start by extending your graphics API abstraction layer with some new ray tracing shader types and ray tracing commands to build acceleration structures and to do ray tracing dispatch commands in command queues. Uh, you will have to somehow figure out uh, how to build an, uh, all the ray tracing acceleration structures for all the geometry in your scene and also how to update this uh, in real time um, whenever uh, geometry forms or when objects move. You will also have to create some new shader types and, and new shaders for, for regeneration and also hit shaders. And you will have to then combine them into a ray tracing pipeline state object. And then you have to update shader parameters as things change in the scene for every object. And once you have all of that done, that's where the fun begins because then you can start experimenting with all these ray tracing techniques. So uh, in a little more detail, um, hope you, hope Second time, yeah. Okay. Well, you will, uh, for building and updating the acceleration structure, um, you should usually just build once for static geometry, but every frame uh, you will typically be rebuilding the entire top level acceleration structure. Uh, I haven't mentioned this, but the API supports what we call a two level acceleration structure uh, where the top level has instances pointing to bottom level acceleration structures. So most of the bottom level ones for static geometry are built ones. But for deformable geometry like skin meshes, you will have to update those every frame. And the way to do that is you, you, typically you will run a compute shader to write the results of a skin end or any deformation into a buffer that you can provide as input to the uh, update acceleration structure command. Then you have to create these new shader types uh, that we mentioned. Um, now, there's a lot of shader code that you've already written in your engine to do shading. Uh, a lot of it, especially if you have a forward shader, uh, is quite useful and you should be able to reuse it. Now, uh, to enable us to do that uh, easily in, a, in an engine as complex as you forward, there are thousands of shaders. Uh, we use an approach that combines the vertex shader and the pixel shader code to, and automatically generates a hit shader using an extension to Microsoft's DirectX compiler. And this allows us also to generate automatically any hit shaders that just compute the alpha test result. You have, once you have all the shaders, you, you have to register them in some way and create a retracing pipeline state object. And finally, every frame you will have to update shader parameters. The naive approach, which is what we do right now, is to just update the shader parameters every frame for every object. Uh, longer term, we expect that the optimal approach will, uh, will actually be more practical and, and for much faster in terms of CPU overhead. And, it, and that approach is to just update what changes every frame. And that will allow us to support really huge scenes that are really not possible in any other way today. Finally, once you've done all of this, you can start experimenting, as I said. So you can start replacing passes for shadow maps or ambient occlusion with and reflections with ray, generation, ray tracing based ones and denoising. And then you can add all the techniques like the path tracing and the light map baking approaches that we just showed, for example. Three optimization tips, uh, just so you, that's an anecdote, if you will, because there are definitely a lot of things that you will have to think about. But First, uh, one approach that we mentioned in the talk with Epic earlier today, we use simplified materials for retracing heat shading and reflections. Second, just build one bottom level acceleration structure when you have an object that has a lot of materials interleaving space. That's more efficient than building separate ones. We used to do that before then, we optimize it. And finally, uh, for shadows and IO, you can use this flag, I'm not gonna read it, but basically it returns the first hit. Uh, rather than find the, the closest hit in Alon Array. That, that will not get you always a correct hit distance Alon Array, but it's usually good enough and, uh, for our, in our experience for Shadows on AO, and it's faster. So, all right, I think that's almost done. Uh, there are a few challenges that we haven't fully tackled yet, We've, uh, that, but we believe there are solutions for them. And here are some of them. One is decals. We have a prototype outside of the engine that is very promising, and we would like to integrate that eventually. Tessellation, uh, it's disabled in our current prototype. It's something that we require somehow streaming out or writing out the output of the tessellator 
into mem memory buffer, we can provide to the acceleration instructor builder as input, and it will probably requ require a lower update rate than, than the tessellation pipeline handles today in raster. And finally, texture LOD, which is really important if you're tracing primary rays, where it's really visible if you don't use proper texture LOD. But it's not as critical if you're doing glossy reflections or if you're doing shadows or, or AO. Uh, so we've experimented with a few approaches for this. We don't, uh, we don't think they are always worth it. They are some overhead. Um, but th there's definitely a lot of uh, ideas uh, that, to make that better and faster. So uh, in our experience for reflections, temporal anti-aliasing uh, gets you a, a, a very far. And, and we, we do not apply any texture LOD. And just to wrap up, uh, I just want to give you the take, takeaways for this talk. Uh, I would like you to remember that with uh, RTX and, and DirectX ray tracing, we're bringing real-time ray tracing to developers today. I think, I believe this is the biggest change in, in graphics API since programmable shading was introduced. So uh, I think we should be happy that, that things are finally evolving again. Um, a few rays per pixel are possible today, and especially for the lighter weight effects like shadows and AO that do less shading. More expensive uh, approaches like path tracing are still really useful for content creation workflow improvements and to help you guide your techniques. We showed a few examples of what's possible, but this is just the beginning. I expect you guys will be showing me next year what you can do with it. And I hope overall this was inspiring and as exciting as it is for us. So thank you for coming. And uh, I just briefly want to mention that we have a call for papers for a book called Ray Tracing Gems that will be edited by Eric Haynes and Thomas Akeny Muller. This call for papers came out on Monday, uh, but just in case you didn't see it, it's here. Deadline is uh, October 15th.